Hi, and welcome to the Neuroethics Learning Collaborative. I'm Martha Farah. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist here at Penn. I direct the Center for Neuroscience and Society here, and I've also put together um, the lectures in the Neuroethics Learning Collaborative, some of which I give, like this one. So today we're going to be talking about uh, brain-computer interfaces, um, and I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about the science and technology of BCI, and then we'll move into the neuroethics, the, what I'm calling here the societal challenges. So what is a brain-computer interface? Well, it's pretty much what it sounds like. <laughs> it is um, a system for either reading out information from the brain um, to be translated by a computer into uh, motor commands or other forms of communication interacting with the outside world. Or, rather than sending the information out from the brain, uh, it's, a, it's an interface that brings information in. So it's a system for bringing information into the brain in a way that enables the equivalent of sensation or perception. But what's key is, you know, rather than the usual ways that we either reach out and act upon the world or um, receive information from the world, with uh, BCI, you have a, a machine, a computer, interfacing directly with the brain. So you're not using your peripheral nervous system. You're not uh, um, launching the actions with your own muscles or getting the information in through your own retina or cochlea or um, whatever. So the ways in which that uh, interface is implemented um, can vary greatly. The, um, the kind of lowest tech, easiest way to um, rig up a brain-computer interface is using scalp-recorded EEG brain waves. Um, and here you can see a couple of uh, systems that do that. One very simple system that actually um, can connect to your iPhone and um, believe it or not, there are apps <laughs> that will um, either record your EEG to help you um, to learn to meditate and relax, you know, as sort of a biofeedback uh, mechanism. Um, there are also some uh, game, uh, electronic games that use um, EEG uh, picked up from, from outside the head uh, to, you know, move players and so forth in a game. Um, this is a headset uh, created by a company called NeuroSky um, that uh, you know, is, is used for a kind of brain machine interface that any of you could order online. I, d I don't know how much it costs, but uh, um, it's, uh, you know, it's readily available. Um, what you see below that is um, a system with many more electrodes um, that is able to direct a um, wheelchair based on brain waves, based on EEG. And um, this is obviously you know, a, 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 a less uh, um, frivolous use of um, scalp-recorded EEG for brain-machine interface. Um, and the idea is that someone who is paralyzed could, um, could direct a, a wheelchair like this experimental system um, demonstrates, using brain activity alone. Now the problem with these kinds of systems that um, severely limits their usefulness is, as, as we know um, from our neuroscience courses, um, EEG is a very sort of uh, very limited and kind of coarse-grained measure of brain activity um, and really only picks up a subset of brain activity. Um, it has very poor localizing ability because of um, all the, you know, the, the distance of the electrode from the um, generators of uh, the activity and all the volume conduction um, that uh, that signal undergoes going from the neurons to the, the electrode. Um, and also, um, EEG is only tapping into the activity of um, large numbers of synchronized neurons um, that also happen to be orientated in the right direction and so forth. So, um, so it's very limited. 
um, you can get a more localized, kind of better differentiated system from um, electrocorticography, uh, abbreviated ECOG, where they place the electrodes right on the surface of the brain, um, which obviously requires opening up the head, so it's you know more invasive. Um, but the the closer location um, uh, enables um, much more differentiated signals, um, so you can learn um, you know more about uh, sort of localized patterns of brain activity. Certainly more localized relative to what you get outside of the head like this. Um, and this kind of uh, process is already done um, routinely uh, for some cases of um, uh, surgery for epilepsy before they um, go in and do the surgery. Uh, they want to map very precisely um, the, uh, the seizures and the brain activity associated with important cognitive functions that they don't want to disrupt. Um, so uh, this is something that is, um, while invasive, um, it is already done routinely for other reasons. Finally, if you want to really get in there and um, get the most fine-grained, um, uh, local and well-differentiated signals from neurons in the cortex, you need to put the electrodes in the cortex. And that is what has been done in various kinds of preclinical research with BCI. So um, what you see up here is um, a monkey who has um, electrodes in his motor cortex, and he's using them to direct a robotic arm. Uh, and um, we'll talk more about uh, that monkey, and you'll see a video of him uh, momentarily. Um, and finally, uh, there have been a small number of humans who've been implanted with intracortical uh, recording electrodes um, to, uh, to operate um, robotic uh, arms and computer cursors and so forth um, just by thought alone. So continuing with just the basic question of, you know, what, what is a brain-computer interface? What, what do you do with them? Well, um, there are two main applications. Um, the, the first class of applications is to bring information in about the world, um, and that has been done with um, cochlear implants, which uh, substitute for um, uh, um, the sort of uh, normal uh, mechanism by which sound is transduced um, into um, neural impulses. Uh, and artificial retinas, which are still experimental, but do a similar thing with uh, vision. They're also used in um, uh, enabling movement um, and communication for patients who can't move because of paralysis, uh, you know, spinal cord injury, or because of locked-in syndrome. And what we'll see in the next few slides is just examples of recent work using BCI in these, in these kinds of um, applications uh, that um, focus on work with the implanted electrodes. Um, focusing on the implanted electrodes partly because um, it's where you can do the most, you can get the best signals in and out, um, and uh, uh, so um, you know, ultimately you can solve more problems and uh, you know, achieve better outcomes for the patients, um, and also because obviously that's a bigger deal ethically, and so the neuroethical issues you know, really come up when you're talking about this very invasive procedure of sticking hardware in somebody's head. The first type of uh, BCI that uh, I want to um, mention to you um, is cochlear implants. Um, these are actually in use now. In fact, um, as of spring of 2009, there were 188,000 people in the world um, with cochlear implants. Um, a cochlear implant uh, consists of a microphone and a signal processor, that's essentially the, the machine, the, the computer, um, that uh, 
interfaces via implanted electrodes with the auditory nerve. So this is a way to um, you know, essentially restore hearing, not, not to normal levels, um, but good enough that you can um, understand speech, even listen to music. Um, this person here is Michael Korist. He wrote um, a wonderful book about his own experience um, as the recipient of bilateral cochlear implants called Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. And um, his hearing is good enough that the very first time I ever interacted with him, it was via a phone call. And I really had no idea what to expect, if he was going to be able to understand me or not. And I never would have known that uh, I was talking to somebody with a hearing problem. So um, cochlear implants have been wonderfully successful. Um, in fact, successful enough that some within the deaf community fear that it is going to spell you know, the end of deaf culture, um, that uh, there will be no more uh, people who are deaf and therefore kind of uh, invested in ASL um, and all of the, the art and literature and culture that goes with it. Um, there are also BCIs for vision. Um, several different companies are developing uh, artificial retinas. Um, some of them, uh, most of them connect to the optic nerve in the eye, but some actually directly stimulate visual cortex. And although these are um, still experimental, they have certainly enabled people to have some degree of form vision um, to actually see which way the big E on the vision chart is pointing um, and so forth. For movement, um, the research is uh, you know, mostly what's called preclinical. Um, that is, you know, work with animals to try to understand um, the, the general approach that might work and be useful. Um, but um, uh, the research has been um, advancing quickly um, in the last um, 10 years. Um, I can tell you some of the achievements. They've been quite impressive. Um, so uh, one, one of the really um, exciting developments that I think you know, made the daily newspapers, not, not just science journals, was um, work out of uh, Miguel Nicolelis's lab at Duke, where um, he had a setup like this, where he taught a monkey to um, move a cursor around on a screen using a joystick, meanwhile um, recording from electrodes implanted in the monkey's motor cortex. And um, unbeknownst to the monkey, um, his uh, actions were also being, um, or the, sorry, the brain activity corresponding to his actions were also being relayed to a robotic arm um, out of sight of the monkey. Um, and after a while, they, the researchers disconnected the joystick from the computer, okay, so that basically what was making the uh, cursor move around was the monkey's brain activity. Very interestingly, um, the, at least the two monkeys that they tested this on, um, after a while figured out that they did not need to be using the joystick and just stopped, stopped touching it altogether and sat there just spontaneously um, moving, moving the cursor using their brain waves alone. Um, and of course, in addition to moving the cursor, they were also manipulating the robotic arm in a remote um, location. Um, another, oops, there's another um, study that I'm going to show you a video of where um, uh, Andrew Schwartz and his colleagues at Pittsburgh um, implanted a monkey in a very similar way, motor cortex. Um, this time, they let the monkey see the robotic arm and um, get experience um, using it, driving it with their brain waves, and found that the monkey 
began to treat the arm very much as if it was you know, one of his own appendages and could use it to, um, to feed itself treats. So let me go to this video. You'll see the monkey um, feeding himself with a robotic arm that he's controlling by his brain waves. So the experimenter is moving around where the marshmallow is, and uh, oh, didn't quite get it. There we go. There's one point on this video where there's a little marshmallow goo left on the robotic hand, and the monkey <laughs> licks it. I mean, it really uh, gives you the sense that this monkey has, you know, incorporated this robotic arm into his own uh, body schema, his own sense of self. Okay, well, I think that's probably enough of this monkey. Um, there is also research, there are also, whoops, clinical trials um, with humans using the same kind of system. So in, in this case, um, you're going to see work done by a uh, company called BrainGate that um, has implanted uh, you know, a chip with many electrodes um, into, again, motor cortex and um, allowed uh, paralyzed patients to learn to um, control their brain activity and motor cortex, um, essentially by thinking about making the movements um, to operate uh, um, external devices. And let me show you. A, uh, a video of that. Kathy Hutchinson is among the first humans to have her brain directly wired to a computer. Years ago, Kathy suffered a stroke that left her mentally sharp but trapped inside a paralyzed body and unable to speak, locked in like Scott Mackler. Three years ago, Kathy volunteered to have the same kind of sensors we saw in the monkeys implanted in her motor cortex which controls movement and is located right on the surface of the brain. The sensors connect to the computer through this plug on her head. The system is called BrainGate, and it was created by a team led by Brown University neuroscientist John Donahue. If you look at this square, each one of these little black boxes is the electrical signal coming from one electrode in the brain. And each one of those is a neuron fire. Right. It's its electrical potential. It lets out a one thousandth of a second pulse. How well do we understand this language? We have a somewhat of an understanding. We know that there's a general pattern of, for example, left, right, up, down, even fast or slow. Scott, Kathy now has neural control over that person. Dr. Lee Hochberg of Massachusetts General Hospital is leading the clinical trial. We watched together as Kathy showed us what she can do. There's a handful of icons that have been placed on the screen. Here's Google, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and then here's uh, Mass General Hospital Service. Service. Yep. We're seeing Kathy moving this cursor with nothing but her mind. That's right. She's thinking about the movement of her hand, and uh, she's moving the cursor much, much as if she had her hand on a mouse. So if a patient who's paralyzed thinks, move my left arm, the brain fires those neurons, Yes, even though the arm does not move. Yes, it's very surprising. It, it fires even though you're not moving. The cursor's still a little bit wavier. Moving the cursor with her mind is not as fluid or direct as using a mouse. While we were there, the cursor meandered a bit, sometimes overshot. But Kathy always hit her target in the end. You want to uh, play some music? All right. So click on it. Imagine you squeezing her hand, which would be uh, like doing something else with the click. And she just clicked play. Yep, she did. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And so, I mean, if Kathy can control a cursor, she can control anything a computer is connected to. That's the goal. The lights, the temperature in the room, even, even a wheelchair at some point. 
ready to try it for real? In fact, Kathy has already driven a wheelchair. See if we can drive it right over to the door. They haven't let her ride in it yet for her own safety. But with monkeys adopting robot arms and a completely paralyzed person driving a chair, imagine where this could be headed. Fantastic. Very good. <laughs> Okay, so clearly in the last uh, 10 years, there's been tremendous progress um, in uh, interfacing brain activity to outside machinery. Um, what are some of the current um, remaining barriers to be overcome scientifically and technically? Well, you know, I should say I do not work in this area, but um, I attended a meeting last fall um, put on by the New York Academy of Sciences and the Aspen Brain Institute. There was kind of a summit meeting of all the leading researchers, including the people that have been mentioned so far, um, in brain-machine interfaces. And one of the interesting things about this meeting is people were talking about, you know, what are the outstanding problems that need to be solved, and what are some promising solutions um, that people are working on. And I would say that um, the two uh, of the two biggies. The first is just maintaining the connection between the machinery and the brain. Um, the brain, like every other part of the body, reacts to um, having a foreign body uh, lodged in it. Um, there are all kinds of um, you know, immune responses, inflammation, scarring, and so forth that um, take what starts out as a, a good, useful contact and, um, and makes it, over time, uh, convey much less useful information. So um, people are trying all kinds of uh, you know, end runs around this, all kinds of ways of solving the problem. You know, the end runs, including um, uh, methods that don't involve um, electrodes at all, but um, involve uh, optical methods um, and, uh, and chemical interfaces. Um, there are also attempts to design electrodes that um, will sort of encourage the, the neuropill to just grow right into the electrode um, and, uh, you know, rather than um, sort of encapsulate it. Um, so much um, varied and, you know, interesting and very promising work um, along those lines. The other big challenge is um, just figuring out how to translate brain activity into um, you know, commands to the outside world and or um, uh, design signals that can be put into the brain in a way that um, uh, is, is useful, that the rest of the brain can make use out of. Um, and there's a lot of work going on here. This is, you know, really the stuff of much basic science research as well as, you know, research aimed at brain-machine interfaces. Um, in fact, um, one of the big, uh, you know, impetuses to, to start doing these um, motor systems um, was work of Georgiopoulos, just, you know, basic science research um, looking at population coding in uh, motor cortex, looking at the way um, information available from, you know, neurons sampled across, you know, electrode arrays um, uh, corresponded with the monkey's intention to move his eyes somewhere in space or reach somewhere in space. And um, so that, you know, that work goes on. It's, um, uh, it's of interest in its own right scientifically. and. It's one of the things that has to be better understood um, to create, um, uh, you know, interfaces that, um, you know, enable people to do sort of more complex and highly differentiated things rather than just, you know, get a cursor to slowly drift to one side or the other. Um, so it's sort of bandwidth, being able to, you know, get that information out quickly and precision. So having given you a little um, summary of uh, state of the art in brain machine interfaces, um, brain computer interfaces. Now I want to go to the neuroethics of the area. 
there are a tremendous variety of ethical, legal, and social issues, what we call the ELSIs, E-L-S-I, um, and uh, you know, very, very different in kind, you know, run, running the gamut from you know, transhumanist cyborgs to um, uh, you know, intellectual property problems, you know, how do you encourage innovation, um, encourage uh, collaboration and so forth um, in terms of the financial stakes. Um, so what I want to do is try to subdivide these different issues um, to um, just kind of uh, lay them out a little more systematically and make them less like just this mountain of um, very heterogeneous issues. Um, I'm going to subdivide them in terms of time frame. And uh, the, the sort of boundary points between immediate, medium term, and long term are, you know, just my probably not terribly educated uh, guesses. Um, but I think um, it's, it's worth distinguishing between the immediate, the medium, and the long term challenges. And this is my, you know, best guess at uh, how that maps onto a calendar. Um, but you will see that um, the salt shakers are a reminder that <laughs> this, you know, is pure conjecture. Um, so take the actual numbers there with a grain of salt. Um, but whether the numbers are, um, you know, optimistic, uh, it's going to actually take longer, pessimistic, it'll be here sooner. Um, however the numbers are off, I do think that these issues um, do apply um, for each of these three categories. So let's start with the long-term issues. You know, these are the sort of big, you know, scary, sexy, depending on your, you know, perspective, um, issues of how humanity itself may be changed by merging with machines. Um, some people find this idea very scary um, and uh, think it should be stopped. Um, Francis Fukuyama, um, author of Our Post-Human Future, um, wrote a journal article um, a few years after Post-Human Future was published um, called you know, Transhumanism, the World's Most Dangerous Idea. Um, the idea is, the idea of transhumanism that uh, Fukuyama finds so dangerous um, is that as we begin um, adding to our capabilities and changing the way our bodies and minds work um, using technology, um, we will eventually change ourselves so much that we won't be human beings anymore that we just will not be recognizable as members of the species that we all are now. Um, and this is the idea of transhumanism, that we transcend um, the limitations of being a human being. Um, we could be you know, smarter and have amazing memories and be able to perceive you know, infrared and you know, uh, on and on. It's kind of science fiction-like. But I want to say that there's really no reason that I have heard that suggests that we couldn't do it, or even that suggests that we wouldn't do it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a long way off. Uh, in my little uh, timeline, I'm saying, you know, 30 or more years away. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely already on people's minds. Um, and some people think it's a terrible thing. Now, some people think it's a dandy thing. They think being a human being is all about self-improvement, um, uh, making over the world, and even making over yourself uh, to better suit your aims and goals and desires. And um, what used to be called the World Transhumanist Association, and is now goes by the name Humanity Plus, um, is a whole international network of people um, who are interested in the idea of transhumanism and who look forward to it. So what are some of the um, ethical issues that we will encounter 
um, in the long term uh, when we begin to you know, link up with computers. Well, one person who has discussed this is a computer science professor um, in England uh, at the University of Reading named Kevin Warwick. Um, he wrote a, an article um, on sort of ethical issues in uh, you know, brain-computer interfaces in 2003 in the journal Ethics and Information Technology. And here's, here's some of his thoughts. This is what we might be able to do. And he's saying, like, this is a good thing. Um, if uh, um, people could link their brains directly to computers. Oh, and before, I, before we go through this list of um, things that we could do um, once we're hooked up like that, I should tell you that he is such an enthusiast for brain-machine interfaces and for you know, sort of transhumanism that he has already um, been implanted with various um, gadgets. Um, including an electrode array in his arm, that you see here, which picks up um, impulses from, his, uh, from, from the nerves in his arm and um, enable him to you know, open doors and turn lights on and off and so forth um, uh, using just uh, you know, um, peripheral nervous activity. So, um, so this man um, has put his money where his mouth is. <laughs> he um, has already gone cyborg um, and uh, you know, eagerly awaits the time when the, the chip will be in the brain, not the arm, and we can do things such as um, use the computer for rapid maths. I guess he's English, so he puts an S on the end of that word. Um, but you know, the idea is that um, you don't need to like get out the calculator and use your finger to punch numbers in. Um, you can just sort of think, you know, the uh, whatever long complicated expression you want to get the uh, value of and the computer will um, read that thought and then send you the answer. Um, you can call on, you know, the entire base of knowledge in the uh, World Wide Web. Um, you know, rapidly and effortlessly by thinking. Um, you could have memories of experiences that you didn't experience yourself. So you could upload somebody else's memory into your own brain. Um, you could sense the world in a plethora of ways. Um, you know, ultrasound, uh, you know, infrared, uh, um, you know, what, whatever physical signals there are out there, you know, polarized light, whatever. You could, um, you could have peripheral devices that pick those up and feed them to your brain. Um, you could understand multidimensionality, perhaps, in a way that we can't do without, um, you know, with our limited working memory capacities and spatial ability. Um, and you could communicate by thought signals alone, brain to brain. And I, th I do believe his wife um, also has a chip, and you know the idea is that someday they'll be able to, you know, send um, what do they call it? You know, sweet little nothings to each other, um, not whisper sweet little nothings, but um, uh, twitch them by the arm. Okay. So, um, what are the um, ethical implications of this. Um, well, he says that um, basically cyborgs may become so capable, so uh, intellectually capable, that they would find anything that an unimplanted, unenhanced human has to say sort of trivial. Um, they would care about their own kind, you know, much as we care about our kind. And, um, you know, uh, humans may not figure too highly uh, in their view. And um, then in terms of our treatment of them, uh, could, we, could we expect them or could we expect ourselves if, if, if we upgrade? Um, to, uh, to sort of you know, merge, in effect, and just become nodes in some supercomputing network. 
I have to say that, you know, the um, by and large, the the uses that Warwick envisions in this article um, don't seem all that compelling. I mean, I, for one, would not want you know brain surgery um, just to not have to put my fingers on a calculator, <laughs> um, and you know. Likewise, searching the internet with Google is fine. Um, I don't. I don't mind having to um, uh, do it outside my head. Um, but I do think that as we approach the the point of, you know, thirty years from now or whatever, um, we'll have more experience with the things that we can do um, and the things that work well and the things that people like having tried them. Um, and I, I think we will discover other kinds of attractive options um, that, uh, you know, brain-computer interfaces um, might offer us. And I do think that, you know, as with any kind of permanent modification of a person, whether it's by genetic engineering or by um, gadgetry, um, if the, um, you know, if the result is uh, individuals who are just, you know, far, um, far smarter, far more capable, um, far more, you know, who knows, maybe far more ethical and caring. I mean, you know, there's lots of different ways a brain could be upgraded. Um, I, I think um, I, I do somewhat resonate with, um, you know, with this concern, like what would happen to the people who don't enhance? Um, you know, he suggests that um, these cyborgs of the future may regard human beings kind of the way human beings regard chimps right now. And, you know, some people are nice to chimps, but some chimps, you know, suffer at the hands of humans. And, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to know um, what, how that would go um, if some of our uh, species decide to upgrade and, and others don't. So this is, I think, you know, really long-range reasoning about what the ethical issues are. Um, you know, it's very hard to not sound a little silly and a little fanciful um, and a little like you're borrowing trouble, like, you know, you're afraid of being oppressed by, you know, people with computers in their heads, you know, aren't there better things to worry about in this day and age? Um, and I think that's all very true. Um, and I think we just have to recognize that we are talking very long range here, and maybe we can more fruitfully revisit these issues uh, when some of the nearer term issues have been um, lived through, you know, experienced um, and learned from. So what about the medium term? This is, again, on my, you know, rough uh, guesstimate timeline between about 10 years from now and 30 years from now. This, what I mean by medium term is um, when the technologies are routinely used, okay? So there are some that are used now in clinical practice, cochlear implants. There are others that are um, getting there. But what about um, when, you know, sizable numbers of our brethren um, have brain implants that are either bringing information in or taking information out, what will be the, um, what will be the ethical challenges um, at that point? And the answer that I have is OK. One issue is going to be, you know, more of a traditional bioethical issue. Who's going to have access to brain-computer interfaces, to therapeutic brain-computer interfaces? Okay, we're, again, we're not talking about, you know, making super brains. Um, we're talking about helping paralyzed people to move through the world. We're talking about helping blind people to see. Um, these are expensive technologies. And, you know, of course, price comes down as volume goes up and all that, but, you know, they, um, they're they expensive to implant and they require maintenance. It isn't just sort of pop it in and you're good to go. Um, 
So, you know, compared to the cost of other kinds of health care, you know, is this, um, you know, is this going to be viewed as something that, you know, your health plan should cover? Um, uh, you know, does, does, does the, um, does, is the expense justifiable um, for the help that it gives the individuals who are helped? Um, and, uh, you know, how, how, will, how will we manage that as a society, um, getting, uh, getting them to the people who need them? Uh, okay. Another ethical issue that I think will arise once, you know, some of these systems are actually out there in clinical use is control, control of the inputs and the outputs. Um, how much control should patients have? Um, you know, now um, you can turn off your hearing aid if you're, you know, sick of hearing your old spouse yammer on, <laughs> you know, or, um, uh, you know, you can, um, I, I don't know, you could, you know, but. The, the question is, um, should patients be able to, you know, vary, um, uh, you know, the, the range of, um, uh, you know, sensory signals that they're getting, um, the kinds of, uh, the ways they want the output of uh, their motor system to be used, um, to what extent uh, will um, the medical establishment sort of say, yeah, this is something we're giving you, it's to enable you, and you know, you're in the driver's seat, you, you make these decisions. Um, what about involuntary treatment? Um, you know, certainly for some psychiatric conditions um, that might uh, benefit from, um, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a stimulation protocol that might be initiated by a computer when certain patterns of brain activity are detected, um, uh, you could imagine, um, uh, you know, involuntary treatment being imposed with BCIs the same way it's imposed with drugs for the safety of the person or society. Um, but unlike drugs that, you know, basically wash out of your system as soon as you stop taking them, you know, this is, this is major brain surgery that leaves, you know, a device in your head. Um, so, you know, in the medium term, again, a fairly straightforward bioethical issue, but one that will, I think, arise once, um, once we have uh, um, BCIs in common use. Um, finally, <coughs> concerning control of inputs and outputs, um, what to do about hackers. So, you know, people already, you know, for, for motivations that are, you know, un unclear to me, you know, write computer viruses and send them around the world, um, infecting people's computers, their cell phones. Um, we have people who, you know, for, you know, to, to, to steal money or to just, just out of curiosity, you know, hack into secure systems of banks or the Pentagon or whatever. Um, what if one of these hackers wants to hack into your brain, right? Um, I mean, there are, there are issues, um, not, you know, not insurmountable issues, like all of these issues. It's just, you know, there are precedents. We have dealt with um, analogous kinds of problems before, but those problems, I think, will have to be addressed here um, because uh, you really don't want you know, hackers hacking into your brain. Um, another application, uh, uh, sorry, another um, medium term ethical issue once we have these uh, being developed is um, which applications will be developed. So, um, you know, we've already seen with the iPhone, you know, on the outside of the head um, interface, uh, you know, people are designing gaming systems because you can sell them and you don't have to worry about lawsuits with, you know, somebody being harmed. Um, uh, will, um, you know, games, games might be uh, an economically attractive area. Um, uh, certainly um, treatments for very common conditions are attractive 
for the device manufacturers because those are conditions that you know um, they can sell a lot of the product to. But what about you know orphan conditions? You know what about diseases that affect very few people? What about um, diseases that affect you know mainly poor people, third world people, um, where they aren't going to be able to sell much? Are we going to um, uh, are we going to ignore those needs? Um, again, you know, nothing stunningly novel, but I think um, these are the things that will arise with BCI once um, once it becomes established as a treatment modality. Um, and finally, um, you know, what I'm referring to as the yuck factor. Um, if if BCI um, can be uh, used um, safely, uh, you know, without a lot of complications, then it will be considered for um, increasingly non-serious, non-dire conditions. Um, will people will people uh, embrace that, or will they um, will they just find it unthinkable to um, have something, you know, put in their brain for something that isn't you know, I'm locked in, I need some way to communicate with the outside world. Um, okay. And then finally, frank enhancement. Um, will, um, you know, will people, contrary to the last point, will people actually seek out um, uh, enhancements based on brain machine interfaces? Um, maybe you're a patient who already has to be implanted with an interface device, um, let's say, you know, for vision. Um, but you say, well, gee, as long as you're, you know, rigging up this artificial retina for me, can you um, let me see, you know, infrared too? Um, uh, could be useful for various... Uh, Reasons. I mean, I'm not sure why somebody would want to see infrared, but 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 the point is, once um, once you have to be implanted for a therapeutic reason anyway, there may be ways that your implant can extend your capabilities beyond what um, you know it would what what it's intended to restore. Um, so maybe like motor uh, motor function, you know, could you? Um, you know, if we get to the point where there are, you know, sort of robotic exoskeletons that can, um, you know, not just let people move cursors on screens with, um, with brain machine interfaces, but actually get up and move around, um, you know, should the, should the exoskeleton be, you know, designed in a way that the person can, you know, leap 10 foot high barriers and be like a superhero? Um, uh, that would be that would be an enhancement that um, seems like once you're doing the therapy, the enhancement is um, really a, just a short hop from there. But I think it has ethical implications. So enhancement is an LC topic unto itself, um, and we're not going to go into that um, tonight. Short-term issues. Um, there's not a lot to say here except that um, in the short term, in the next 10 years, I think the way this field is going to develop will depend a lot on various intertwined um, issues that come down to money. So um, the issue of funding, who's, who's paying for these systems to be developed? Um, you know, what's the balance of private and public funding? Conflict of interest, um, you know, uh, who who should be, uh, you know, who should be involved in doing the research? Um, what what should their relationship be with the private companies? Um, how about regulation? Um, should the regulators be people who are in the business and so forth? Um, intellectual property law um, is another biggie that has been. Um, uh, you know, a contentious issue in far the pharmaceutical industry with development of new drugs. Um, depending on how the laws are written or changed, um, it can have the effect of encouraging innovation or um, sort of taking the uh, 
um, incentive away or taking the incentive away to collaborate with um, people who might otherwise be considered rivals. Um, regulation, both of the practice of using brain-computer interfaces once they're you know, up and available, but also of clinical trials. Um, the people at the conference that I went to last fall um, were complaining, they were all complaining about the difficulty of um, getting uh, investigative device um, permits to do clinical trials in this country. Um, I felt kind of sorry for the speaker from the FDA. <laughs> she was, <laughs> she was um, hammered. Um, so apparently uh, clinical trial regulation is at least perceived by the people doing the research as um, a real barrier right now. So going back to the sort of scheme of like three uh, phases and not, you know, not emphasizing the number of years uh, that I hung on them really, but just sort of the idea that we have these here and now problems um, and how we resolve these issues of funding and regulation is going to very much determine um, what the what applications get developed um, and uh, what kinds of conditions are you know these therapies being aimed at and who owns them and you know um, what will the financial incentives be to ex expand beyond the initial um, uh, set of conditions um, addressed. Um, once we get to this phase and begin to deal with these ethical challenges, we will be, you know, in effect living among people who have brain chips, have, have uh, you know, computers interface to their brains. And we will know so much more than we do now about how people think about these things, how how it plays out economically, in terms of people's individual lives. Um, and I think from that platform, um, we will have a much better sense of, you know, long term, um, you know, are people going to be connecting to the internet? Are they going to be, as Warwick said, you know, sort of merging into one big mind melded, you know, web of humanity? Um, will they want to stay individual and so forth? Um, Right now, it's nothing but you know pure speculation that we can apply to thinking about these things. But once we've spent some time living, you know, in this kind of a world, um, I think we'll have a much better sense of, of where the where the concerns are and um, where the you know wonderful opportunities are. So that will from from a sort of platform of living with various kinds of brain machine interfaces for perception and motor control um, will have a much better sense of you know uh, how how that might be parlayed into the longer term future and speaking of sort of step by step going into the longer term future i i just want to leave you with this last um slide cartoon gay and wilson um and i'll read it aloud in case um it's not uh, visible here on the screen. The, uh, the caveman is saying to the modern homo sapiens, um, I was wondering when you'd notice there's lots more steps. So thanks.